Ursula K. Le Guin's second Earthsea novel, The Tombs of Ottoman, does not actually begin in the narrative itself with talk or depiction of the ring of Erith Akba, but that's going to be, in a sense, the if we look at the narrative world, the pretext for there being any story at all, in part because Ged, one of the characters in the story, the main character from the previous novel, and Arya, later Tenar, uh, the priestess of the nameless ones at the tombs of Atuan, would not have become connected if Ged had not come to the Kargish Isles to seek out the missing half of the ring. And so in, in a way, you can't have the story without having the ring. And the ring assumes very central importance as one of the thematics uh, of the story as well. The first mention of it is when the older women, Thar and Castle, are telling Arha about the world and about things that she should know from being the previous priestess and the one before her reincarnated as this child. It says, it still made her feel strange when Thar and Castle spoke to her of things she had seen or said before she died. She knew that indeed she had died and been reborn in a new body at the hour of her old body's death, not only once 15 years ago, but 50 years ago and before that. So what are the things that are being talked about? One of the key things is this story. And Thar and Kassel tell her, many came to rob the tombs long ago, but none ever did so. How would any man dare? They would dare, Kassel said. They were sorcerers, wizard folk from the inner lands. That was before the god kings ruled the Kargad lands. We were not so strong then. The wizards used to sail from the west to Karego, At, and Atuan to plunder the towns on the coast, loot the farms, even come to the sacred city, Abawath. They came to kill dragons, they said, but they stayed to rob towns and temples. So we have wizards and heroes coming from the west to the Kargish lands, right? And they are not just doing the task that they say they're supposed to be doing. They are coming into a place that's disunited politically and perhaps vulnerable to them. They have powers that the Kargs don't uh, have or want or respect powers of sorcery. Also, uh, as, as she goes on to say, um, their great heroes would come among us to test their swords. So there might have been some you know, advantages in brawn or technology or things like that. And what we've got here is an invasion or at least adventuring in these Kargish lands and essentially, you know, mixing up in their politics and uh, despoiling them and, and all of that. So this is part of the backstory. Now, is this completely accurate? Well, we don't really know because it's being told by a Kargish priestess, so perhaps it, it represents their point of view more. It might be more complicated than that, but this is the backdrop. And against that backdrop, she goes on and says, one of them, a mighty sorcerer and dragon lord, the greatest of them all, came to grief here. It was long ago, very long ago, but the tale is still remembered and not only in this place. The sorcerer was named Erith Akba and he was both king and wizard in the West. And we'll learn more about him in the later books and a little bit more about him in, in the stories that as Gad is going to tell as well. But so Erith Akba is somebody at the pinnacle of power and prestige and perhaps even knowledge in Earthsea. And he, he comes to the Kargish lands and he gets mixed up in the politics there. As they say, he joined with certain Kargish rebel lords and fought for the rule of the city with the high priest of the inmost temple of the twin gods in Awabath. So that's kind of a big deal, right? He's trying, according to them, trying to take over one of the main cities and he's fighting with 
this other person who's at the pinnacle of power, this high priest whose name is Intathen, who's going to become the uh, progenitor of an entire lineage of high priests, and then eventually to the god kings who are in, um, you know, at their apex of power at the time that this story is being told. And the god kings are kind of, you know, they've reunited the Kargish lands, and they're also essentially replacing the other power structures in the land, as we're going to see. Now, the story about the ring, right? Here we go. Long they fought the man's sorcery against the lightning of the gods. The temple was destroyed around them. At last, the high priest broke the sorcerer's witching staff and broke in half his amulet of power and defeated him. He escaped from the city and from the Kargish lands and fled across Earthsea to the farthest west, and there a dragon slew him because his power was gone. Since that day, the power and might of the inner lands has ever Wayne. So the, at the time that we're looking at this story, the Kargish lands are able to raid, you know, Gaunt as they did in A Wizard of Earth and some of the other Western Isles. So his, the, the staff, the wizard staff, which is part of the power of the wizard of Erith Akba is broken. And even more important, his amulet of power, the ring of Erith Akba is broken. And what happens to it then? Well, there's, there's two sides to this broken ring, and the high priest uh, in Tothin gives his half to the treasury of the tombs, the tombs of Ottawa, the nameless powers. And what we find later on in the story is that this is in the very inmost part of the labyrinth, the thing that, that Ged is, is seeking, and that so many others have sought as well. Erith Akba gives his half to uh, a, a king, and uh, he's described by Castle in kind of a derogatory way. Um, here we go. Uh, he's given to a petty king, one of the rebels named Thorig of Hapun. Uh, and he says, I, we don't know why he did so. And Castle says, to cause strife to make Thorig proud. And so it did. The descendants of Thorig rebelled again when the house of Tarb ruled. And yet again, they took arms against the first god king, refusing to acknowledge him as either king or god. They were an accursed, ensorcelled race. They are all dead now. Thar nodded. The family of our present god king, the lord who has arisen, put down that family of Hapun, and destroyed their palaces. When that was done, the half amulet, which they had kept uh, ever since the days of Eric, uh, Erith Akba and uh, Intathen was lost. No one knows what became of it, and that was a lifetime ago. So this is setting the stage, right? This is Arya learning about uh, some of the lore of, of her time. And then what do we find? Many thieves and wizards come to Atuan to seek the half ring. It's something that draws people in. And the latest of them is Ged. So we find um, that there's, uh, here we go. She's looking into the, uh, through these peepholes into the inner chambers under the, the tombs. And she sees something. She sees a light. Then she sees a person. Right, And uh, she tells herself, what must I tell Castle? Nothing. Not yet. I am mistress of the labyrinth. This is no business of the god kings. I'll tell her after the thief is dead. How must I kill him? Right? And then she says, how did he get in? Well, only a sorcerer could do it. And she stops and she thinks. She's actually in the, the under uh, tombs themselves. He's a sorcerer, a wizard of the inner lands, seeking the amulet of Erith Akba. So before she was being told a story, now she's suddenly in the story, right? As the priestess of the nameless ones. And now there's a sorcerer, a thief, trying to come in. Ged is a little bit different in that he is actually coming in with the missing half. And when he's captured, right? She has her eunuch uh, Manan with her. He's um, succumbing to thirst and hunger and the psychological pressure, the magical pressure of the nameless ones and their anger at his sacrilege. Um, 
she's, uh, she, she takes the thing from him. She's, uh, here, here's how it goes. Uh, where's his staff, Manon? There, I'll take it. It has magic in it. Oh, and this. This I'll take too. With a quick movement, she sees the silver chain that showed at the neck of the man's tunic and tore it off over his head, though he tried to catch her arms and stop her. Manon kicked him in the back. She swung the chain over him out of his reach. Is this your, ta- your talisman, wizard? Is it precious to you? It doesn't look like much. Couldn't you afford a better one? I shall keep it safe for you. And she slipped the chain over her own head, hiding the pendant under the heavy collar of her woolen robe. You don't know what to do with it, he said very hoarse and pronouncing the words of the Kargish tongue, but cleanly enough. And what we have here is, in fact, the other half of the ring. Not said so as such at that point, but we're going to see as the story goes on, it gets revealed as such, right? There's a discussion in chapter 7 as they're in the, the room um, moving you know, uh, towards the, the ring where they talk a little bit about um, Aerith Akba. She says, who was he? And he says, it's true you would know little of him here, nothing beyond his coming to the Kargish lands. How much of that tale do you know? He, she says, he lost his sorcerer's staff and his amulet and his power like you. He escaped from the high priest and fled into the west and dragons killed, killed him. But if he had come here to the tombs, there had been no need of dragons. And then she, she changes the topic. She doesn't want to talk about Aerith Akba. Eventually, um, they talk about the ring again. And this is at a time of crisis after she's regained her name and they're beginning to uh, develop this, this thing that Ged will identify as trust. So he tells her um, that I found what I was after. She says, the ring, the half ring, you have the other half. The talisman that she took from him was in fact the missing half that had gone to the other Kargish lord. While he was in the treasure room, he found the one thing that he cared about, the missing other half of the ring that had been buried for centuries, perhaps millennia. So he says, um, you took it off and asked me if I couldn't afford a better talisman. The only talisman better than the half of the ring of Aerith Akba would be the whole. But as they say, a half a loaf's better than none. So now you have your half and I have yours. You have my half and I have yours. He smiled across uh, the shadows of the tomb. You said when I took it, I didn't know what to do with it. That was true. And how do you, and you do know? He nodded. So she says, tell me, what is it, the ring and how you came on the lost half and how you came here and why? And so he tells her two things. What is the ring itself? And how did he come into possession of the ring? How he came into possession, that's a story that we find out in A Wizard of Earthsea and recapitulates uh, itself here. He says that um, when I was a little older than you, I was on a chase. That which I hunted tricked me, so I was cast up on a desert isle, not far off the coast of Karago At and Atuan, south and west of here. It was a little islet, not much more than a sandbar, yet two people lived there, an old man and a woman, a brother and a sister. They had not seen any other human face for how long? Years, tens of years. But I was in need and they were kind to me. And she, he goes on and, and says, um, we couldn't talk. I didn't know the Kargish tongue then, and they knew no language of the archipelago. They must have been brought here as young children and left to die. I don't know why and doubt that they knew. They knew nothing but the island, the wind, and the sea. But when I left, she gave me a present. She gave me the lost half of the ring of Aerith Akba. I didn't know it for what it was, no more than she did. The greatest gift of this age of the world, and it was given by a poor old foolish woman in seal skins to a silly lout who stuffed it in his pocket and said thanks and sailed off. Well, I went on and did what I had to do, but all the time I kept the thing with me because I felt a gratitude towards that old woman who'd given me the only present she had to give. I put a chain through one of the holes pierced in it, and I never thought about it. And then one day on Celador, the farthest isle, the land where Aerith Aerith Akba died in his battle with the dragon Orm. On Celador, I spoke with a dragon, one of the lineage of Orm. He told me what I wore on my breast. So 
he learns then about the nature of the ring, and he tells her a little bit earlier, what is this, the ring of Erith Akba? It's not precious looking. It's not even a ring. It's too big, an arm ring, perhaps. No, one, no man knows who it was made for. Alpha on the fair wore it once before the Isle of Soleil was lost beneath the sea, and it was old when she wore it, and at last it came into the hands of Erith Akba. So he didn't create it. It was just the ring he happened to have. The metal is hard silver, pierced with nine holes. There's a design like waves scratched on the outside and nine runes of power on the inside. The half you have bears four runes and a bit of another. Mine likewise, the break came right across that one symbol and destroyed it. That's the lost rune. The other eight are known to mages. Uh, he tells what they are. Uh, the broken rune was the one that bound the lands, the bond rune, the sign of dominion, the sign of peace. No king could rule well if he did not rule beneath that sign. No one knows how it was written. Since it has been lost, there have been no great kings in Havnor. There have been princes and tyrants and wars and quarreling all among the lands of Earthsea. So there, you know, some sort of unity was lost when this ring was broken and that rune was no longer able to be repeated. He goes on and he says, the wise lords and mages of the archipelago wanted that ring back that they might restore the, the lost rune. But they gave up sending men to seek it since none could take the one half from the tombs of Atuan and the other half which Erith Akba gave to a Kargish king was lost. So it was you know, seemingly an impossible feat. Ged takes it on because he has the other missing part of the ring. And in the story, the ring is restored. Tenar, or Arha, makes a choice to trust Ged, to bring the rings together. And then he, through magic, is able to fix the ring. Um, here we go. This, uh, she, she says, you've, you've uh, uh, she gives him the, the uh, broken talisman. And he says, you've set us both free. Alone, no one wins freedom. Let's waste no time. Hold it out again for a little. She closed her fingers over the pieces of silver, but at his request, she held them out on her hand, the broken edges touching. He said a couple words. Sweat br suddenly sprang out on his face. Um, Ged's side, his tense stance relaxed, and he wiped his forehead. There, he said, and picking up the ring of Aerith Akba, he slid it over the fingers of her right hand. There, he regarded it with satisfaction. It fits. It must be a woman's arm ring or a child. Will it hold? She murmured nervously. It will. I couldn't put a mere mending charm on the ring of Aerith Akba, like a village witch mending a kettle. I had to use a patterning, a magic that goes to the depth of the realities and make it whole. It's whole now as if it had never been broken. And so that is uh, what happens. And we get to the very end of the story. As he says, the story comes whole, um, even as the ring is made whole, but it is a cruel story, Tenar. The little children in the aisle, the old man and women I saw, they scarcely knew human speech. What happened to them? Well, we find out the rest of the story of the ring. I was told the tale. It is part of the knowledge of the first priestess. This is, this is Arha, or Tenor, at this point. Thar told it to me, first when Castle was there, then more fully when we were alone. It was the last time she talked to me before she died. There was a noble house in Huppen who fought against the rise of the high priest in Abawath. The founder of that house was King Thorig, and among his treasures he left his descendants was the half ring which Erith Akba had given him. God says, that indeed is told in the deed of Erith Akba. It says, in your tongue it says, when the ring was broken, half remained in the hand of the high priest and half in the hero's hand. And the high priest sent the broken half to the nameless, to the ancient of the earth in Atoan, and it went into the dark and to the lost places. But Erith Akba gave the broken half into the hands of the maiden Tiareth, daughter of the wise king, saying, Let it remain in the light, in the maiden's dowry. Let it remain in this land until it be rejoined. So spoke the hero before he sailed to the west. And then Tenar responds, So it must have gone from daughter to daughter. 
uh, or this is Gad, of that house over all the years. It was not lost, as your people thought, but as the high priests made themselves into the priest kings, and when the priest kings made the empire and began to call themselves God kings, all this time the house of Thora grew weaker and weaker, and so at, at last, so Thar told me, there were only two of the lineage of Thorag left, little children, a boy and a girl. The God king in Abawath was the father of him who rules now. He had the children stolen from their palace in Huppen. There was a prophecy that one of the descendants of Thorag of Huppen would bring about the fall of the empire in the end, and that frightened him. He had the children stolen away, taken to a lonely isle somewhere out in the middle of the sea, and left there with nothing but the clothes they wore and a little food. He feared to kill them by knife or strangling or poison. They were of kingly blood, and murder of kings brings a curse even on the gods. They were named Ansar and Anthil. It was Anthil who gave you the broken ring. And so what we see in this story being told and brought to a close is a mirroring of the ring itself being restored. We have all of these pairings, all of these broken things being brought back together. And among them are the two who have agency as characters, Ged and Arha, who has regained her name of Tenar. 